Hi, my name is Jonathan Velasco, and I would like to welcome you to the Elmer Femme webinar series, part two. Uh, in the beginning of our series, uh, we, uh, we covered the uh, core functionalities of Elmer, uh, as well as the computer uh, parallel computing capabilities of Elmer. Then we also uh, uh, did a webinar on the library Elmer Open Phone. We covered electrical circuits and uh, how to solve coils and electromagnetic applications. Uh, we covered solvers for solid mechanics. We did some uh, work on induction machines. Uh, then we did a presentation on our uh, the Python interface for Elmer. Um, um, and then we ended the first uh, uh, session with uh, industrial applications uh, focused on microwave modeling. Now, this is the second instance of the program. We started the, the program with uh, coil modeling. And now today we'll be covering geophysical applications uh, with Elmer Ice and Elmer Fem. And next week, we're gonna have another uh, webinar focused on multi-physics simulation. Uh, please, if you have any questions to, throughout this uh, webinar, don't hesitate to raise your hand using the, uh, the link, I guess, uh, in, in the screen. And all these presentations uh, will be available uh, in our Nick Funded uh, site. And next week, it will be available to you, the actual webinar, the recording, uh, on YouTube. And if you want any other information, there's also uh, the previous uh, uh, webinars we made are all uploaded into our channel, Elmer Femme. And now I will give the floor to my colleague, uh, Thomas Zwena. Hello, thank you. I think I steal the shared screen from you. If I may. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. I can see your yeah. screen. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you for the introduction and uh, hello to a very small circle I see. Um, uh, there were a lot of more people registered. I hope there was no technical issue with the connection, uh, but yeah, well, we take it from here uh, on a small circle and uh, uh, that uh, might make the uh, question round either short or more interactive. We will see in the end how things are going. So um, what I want to talk today is about geophysical applications uh, beyond, but uh, uh, motivated by their origins uh, in connection to Elmer eyes. So uh, in particular, we'll talk about a recently developed uh, uh, model for glacial isostasy. So the deformation of uh, the earth uh, in response to ice load and uh, and uh, also ocean load or whatever you put on top of it and uh, in the second part I will uh, introduce you to new developments on a groundwater permafrost model that mainly has been uh, uh, applied to nuclear uh, uh, waste repository risk assessment. So these are the points here. Uh, I start by uh, mentioning uh, the people who have been contributing to that, because this is not done by myself, uh, by far not. Uh, so, of course, the Elma team, then uh, Denny Cohen from uh, New Mexico Tech, and also running his own company in the US, uh, Juha Hartikainen, who is currently at the University of Tampere, uh, Matt King from the University of Tasmania, and also Grace Neild from the University of Durham, and uh, also Tasmania who directly contributed to the uh, contents I will show here. So starting from Elma Ice, which is a quite uh, well-known application, uh, uh, I would say one of the most used ice sheet models on the planet. So this is uh, uh, basically our spearhead uh, in, in, in the uh, field of uh, uh, geophysical applications. Um, we have, uh, different uh, couplings to other uh, components uh, shown here. Uh, what we did is couple to a discrete element model to tackle the problem of calving. Uh, currently in progress already with uh, one uh, publication, we have an ice ocean coupler called FISOC that is 
uh, stuff that has been done by Rupert Gladstone. Um, and what I will talk today, focus today, is the stuff that has been implemented in ELMA and can be, but necessarily not has to be, coupled to the ELMA ICE um, uh, program. So one already said uh, is a viscoelastic earth model. The other one is a groundwater permafrost model. Okay, so let's start with the first one, um, the viscoelastic earth model. Um, if uh, you're not familiar, also apology, apologies for, for repeating stuff you already know. Uh, the structure of Earth is such that we have a crust that is uh, very, very thin compared to the overall size of the planet, uh, usually in average uh, 20 kilometers thick, can be of course thicker, can be thinner. Um, sometimes it breaks, then uh, we have uh, volcanism uh, like in, in Iceland. Um, so, but the Earth crust space basically can be modeled or thought of as a brittle elastic plate. And underneath we have the asthenosphere, which is the upper part, the mineral upper part of the mantle, which already has a significant uh, uh, feature of uh, being a viscous material uh, with viscosities in the range of 10 to power 19, 10 to power 21 uh, Pascal seconds. And, uh, and then further down, of course, we have the mantle and then uh, the core, which we are not dealing with uh, in our model. Uh, so we stop usually at the mantle. And uh, naturally, if you put a load on that um, elastic plate, uh, you will trigger a response in terms of a deformation that further, of course, uh, has consequences to shift material due to this viscosity, uh, viscous behavior uh, underneath. So that uh, is the physics that has to be accounted for in the Earth uh, model. And if we look uh, at uh, the buildup of the of of, of these uh, of these uh, regions, uh, um, if we go down in depth, so this is a picture from the from a reference, uh, uh, highly referenced uh, paper. Uh, called the, the uh, preliminary reference earth model. We see that we have uh, regions of uh, quite constant density, viscosity, etc. Uh, that uh, have sharp transitions towards the next regions. So basically we have kind of a layered structure of uh, the planet uh, we are standing on and that has to be accounted for. So if we look here, this is already plugging into a test model we made uh, for that application. Uh, we have the lithosphere uh, consisting of uh, here different layers, three uh, to name it, then uh, five layers representing the mantle, the upper mantle, and uh, further five representing the lower mantle with uh, here different uh, uh, values for the uh, describing material parameters given. And let me point out that, uh, and we will see this later, uh, viscosity in the lithosphere is given, but it's set to a very high value. This is very important, whereas the Young's modulus is always in the same order of magnitude. Um, so this is the elastic, the, the describing elastic uh, property. In our model, as you see here, Poisson's ratio, actually we have implemented a incompressible uh, um, approach. Uh, so the Poisson ratio was just used for uh, different applications. Uh, I will show you later. So the um, model then we built up uh, looks like that. So you here you have the thickness of the different layers down to the uh, lower mantle. Uh, uh, with a radius of about uh, 4,000 kilometers. So we cover about uh, 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 2,000 kilometers down uh, from the upper part, from the, from the surface of the, of the model. And this is called, I didn't invent the name, a flat earth model. Uh, this is uh, referring to what uh, has been used in the literature. I know that uh, this is a, sometimes uh, can be misinterpreted this name. So it's a non-self-gravitating flat Earth model. Flat means that we don't account for the curvature of the planet in this case. 
which has some restrictions to the model, admittedly. Okay, if we look at the implementation, how standard linear elasticity is uh, implemented in finite elements, usually we basically solve the divergence of the uh, strain tensor, uh, of the stress tensor, sorry, which is by rheology linked to the strain tensor. Uh, usually it's zero if there are no uh, net forces applied to the system. Um, so this basically describes an a uh, reversible elastic system. Uh, and we then apply also the assumption of uh, small deformations. That's why we can uh, deal with linear elasticity. Um, if we then want to add uh, a viscous part to it, uh, we are uh, applying a Maxwell type of rheology. And maybe let's, let me switch to a laser pointer here. Then you can depict it better. So that is basically a serial uh, a serial model of a damper which introduces a viscosity here uh, described by the, the, the uh, ITER and uh, a, a spring type elastic element which is the uh, described by the Young's modulus. And in order to implement that, uh, this is uh, along the lines of uh, Patrick Wu's uh, paper in 2004 to implement this uh, system we are on top of solving the uh, linear elastic problem, solving a temporal evolution of the now viscoelastic stress, which is the temporal evolution of uh, the pure elastic stress plus that term. And that is very important. So um, by incompressibility, we are introducing yet another degree of freedom, which is here depicted by the uh, capital pi. Uh, this is the pressure, and then uh, we are referring to the viscoelastic stress here. And uh, um, mu over, over eta is basically um, what, oh, sorry, that uh, didn't work out. Yeah, I'm missing something here, or should I change back? Yeah, anyways, um, so this, this ratio then uh, depicts the uh, the Maxwell, uh, yeah, here, here it comes, the Maxwell time, actually the inverse of the Maxwell time. So if uh, this inverse of the Maxwell time uh, goes to zero, then basically uh, we have a one-to-one uh, -one match of the pure elastic stress evolution. So then viscosity doesn't play a role, but if it goes to order one or even uh, even larger, then there is, of course, a significant contribution uh, by uh, viscosity to the system. And what we, on top of uh, the uh, linear elasticity problem, need is also to account for these uh, jumps in density and gravity over these uh, regions of the Earth. Uh, we need a uh, additional term that accounts for the restoring force by the specific weight gradient which is also called gravitation, gravitational pre-stress uh, advection. So this is usually missing in standard finite element packages and has to be accounted for uh, kind of in a uh, post-processing way by putting jump conditions in form of Winkler foundations there. But now in Elmo, we have the possibility and the advantage to include that into the weak formulation. So we don't have to uh, explicitly take every boundary, uh, layer boundary in the earth and apply these conditions, it's automatically accounted for. Uh, those jump conditions are included simply by including this term into the weak formulation. And that's the big advantage. So to test it, uh, we uh, made this uh, benchmark model. Uh, it is uh, described in this paper here uh, uh, that has been published, I think last year. Yes, 2020. Uh, we have a very wide area. This is very important for the flat earth models. So, you, so even if you have a small load centered, you need a very, very uh, large domain, uh, about uh, uh, 2000 kilometers each side. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we go very deep down, I already showed you. So down to uh, a radius of uh, below uh, 4000 kilometers. 
And uh, what we do is uh, then we put a disk radius, so kind of like a block uh, with the density of ice, which is thick uh, of thickness 100 meters and a radius of 50 kilometers in the center. We instantaneously put it there. So it's a, it's a little bit of a strange benchmark. So it gives a very drastic reaction, of course, uh, because it's an instantaneous load and not growing over time. <laughs> and uh, we, grow, uh, we, we put it there, then let it there for, nine, uh, for 100 years and take it away and look at the reaction. And this is the uh, result of the deformation uh, at about 100 years. So we get about uh, one meter of deformation in the center of the domain. If we show an animation of that, so we have the load, it immediately reacts, then basically nothing happens. And at 100 years, we take it away and then we see a quick uh, return to almost the initial uh, condition because uh, the viscosity below is actually chosen to be quite, uh, quite low. It's 10 to the power of 19 or 18, I don't recall now. And uh, we tested it also against uh, commercial software, in this case, Abacus, using the Winkler foundations to uh, mimic the, the, the pre-stress advection. And uh, you see that uh, at different positions from the center, we get uh, quite well match. Uh, another code has been used, which is called Taboo, which is a, <coughs> excuse me, as a post-glacial rebound calculator. So not based on finite element at all. And even with that uh, particular to the problem tailored code and method, um, we get a very good uh, match between uh, Elmer and both of these codes. And I also did some, um, some investigations on resolutions. Uh, temporal as well as uh, spatial. So we have the reference mesh with about uh, 10 kilometers minimal horizontal resolution. <clears throat> uh, then a very coarse one, which uh, turns out to be not sufficient. So it deviates from all the other solutions and uh, a uh, very uh, or double in resolution mesh, which basically already coincides with the standard mesh. So if you go too low of a resolution, of course, you usually actually overestimate <laughs> uh, the, the, the load on the system and get a too strong response. And uh, same, we use the different resolutions also for doing uh, some uh, scaling uh, investigations. So the strong scaling, same size problem, double uh, uh, computational resources had a speed up actually of 2.2. So uh, above linear, which I think was a lucky hit, um, maybe some faster memory access on the system and a weak scale up. So just uh, 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 doubling the size and doubling the resources uh, revealed a scale up uh, of about 0 0.61, which is still acceptable actually in HPC terms, although not uh, um, uh, something you would uh, brag a lot about. But in principle, the message is that the thing scales also for larger systems. And um, if you want to try that out, a very simple 2D layer version uh, and two-dimensional actually has been included uh, in, the, in one of the uh, ELMA tests. Uh, so if you have the ELMA source code, you can see it uh, under this. Uh, subdirectory. The slides actually will be shared so you can uh, pick that up later. Don't have to take notes on that if you're interested. Um, that's nice, uh, but uh, not a really realistic model to test with. So what I did next is uh, actually did in the last few days, uh, just for the heck of it, uh, I really tried to mimic a real ice sheet and took a two dimensional very simplified two layer model. Or you can see here the uh, viscous and the elastic properties. And um, uh, basically created a growing ice sheet that advances for 5,000 years from zero to 3, uh, 300 kilometers. 
uh, getting a maximum thickness of uh, about uh, 1.5 kilometers. And then also I had a linear retreat <coughs> of the same model or of the same ice sheet. Um, we have a 12 kilometer thick crust and then just 600 kilometers uh, below uh, uh, the mantle with constant uh, properties. And we have, and this actually you will see turned out to be a little bit too uh, small of an area. We have uh, 2000 kilometers wide, um, uh, wide uh, horizontal span of the whole uh, area. And um, to show you what uh, one has to do if you're interested in the Solvay input file. So one has to prescribe these uh, Young's modulus and uh, also the viscosity for the different parts. So these are the different layers. Um, that's all you need. Um, here, uh, 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 here, here it's basically described by simple putting a parameter file and then reading these parameters. Um, and uh, in the body force, uh, I have to prescribe these uh, gravitational pre-stress advections. So first I have to tell it to be true, such that the linear elasticity knows to include that term. And then I have to give this prefactor here. The rest is done inside the code. So the prefactor is simply the density times the gravity that is uh, valid in this particular layer. Because of course, gravity uh, changes the further you go inside to the planet. And then all one has to do is basically then uh, call the traditional uh, stress solver, which is the linear elasticity analysis in, in ELMA. Um, a good strategy actually is um, to uh, use uh, for stabilization because we have a problem that uh, includes the uh, variable of a pressure. <clears throat> so it's a kind of settle point problem like in the Stokes problem, actually. So it's the best strategy for stabilization is to use P2 and then actually linear uh, polynomials are uh, automatically chosen for the pressure part. <clears throat> so if you don't do that, if you go for higher order uh, elements for all parts and then use just double for stabilization, we usually get these, uh, these um, instabilities in the pressure. But uh, choosing that strategy, actually, it's, it's very good. It's very stable and it nicely gives you the result. So here we have the growing ice sheet. You see the deformation and now it retreats. And actually we have a rest deformation. So let me show that again, perhaps. Let's go back. So advancing ice sheet, the earth is uh, deforming underneath and then we have the retreat. And uh, we have a final uh, uh, deformation of still 1.5 meters, even if the ice sheet is gone. So we still have an uplift going on, even in deglaciated conditions. And actually, there is a downlift going on, still uh, some length of the original ice sheet away in the domain. That's exactly what we see today. So we still see, for instance, here in the Fennoscandian area, a uh, quite vast uplift, which is highest at the previous dome of the ice sheet, uh, where else further away, like in Denmark or Netherlands, actually the uh, uh, surface is slightly subsiding still. Still as a result of the late glacial maximum load that of course has vanished by now. And here we see the, the solution of the pressure. It's nice and smooth uh, according to the right choice of the stabilization we took. Uh, and uh, we also get results for the viscoelastic stress. So this is the, the vertical uh, uh, deviatoric stress, uh, which naturally at the highest uh, advance of the ice sheet is highest directly under the ice sheet. No surprise here. Uh, what you might have spotted here, and that is an indication that our far field condition, which is no deformation at all, is put too close to the ice sheet. So we should have had a longer distance chosen, so a wider area. Uh, 
we get some reaction here and that should not be the case. So in that sense, it would indicate that you would actually make a wider area to compute the problem. Same here with the uh, uh, shear stress component, you see something happening at this side. So if you're interested, I put that on my private GitHub um, repository, so you can download it. Uh, it's under Tietzwinger at GitHub GIA 2D test. Um, I think I immediately jump into the second part of the talk, uh, which is the groundwater permafrost model and then take uh, questions also for that afterwards. Um, so we are currently developing a groundwater permafrost model, mainly in the contents of, uh, as you will see later, uh, of uh, nuclear uh, waste repository safety assessment. And if you're interested to test it, but with the disclaimer that is still under heavy development, you can uh, check out the uh, normal ELMA CSC GitHub repository and uh, then uh, change the branch to permafrost uh, dash devil uh, because um, this is the, the, the development branch. We don't want to interfere with the main branch. So we will want uh, to keep things apart. If you're interested to test things at this stage, uh, this would be the thing to check out. So what does this contain? Uh, we have heat transfer, groundwater transport of a, and this is uh, maybe the most uh, confining assumption here of a saturated aquifer, uh, solute transport, so transport of salts, which can be very important because salts can tremendously uh, change the flow as well as, of course, the pressure melting point of, of, the, of the liquid constitution, uh, consti uh, part of the material. Uh, and uh, bedrock deformation, but not in the sense of, uh, of the deformation I showed you now uh, of the glacial adjustment, but really soil deformation. So deformations are in the range of maximum meters uh, in our model here. It's basically just a densification of soil and 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 rock. Um, I don't go into the technical details. Um, we had to do a few tricks to get the accuracy and still have planned to uh, improve the model by uh, using mixed formulation uh, in order to to improve the behavior of the uh, advection dominated parts of the uh, of the problem. But we have these uh, four components, and they are basically every component is uh, described as a single problem. And we have then uh, highly mutual coupling between those uh, just imposed by physics. And naturally, and this is the connection to ELMA ice, of course, we can create the ice load as well, the heat exchange, as well as the water source from a ice sheet model living above. And since we have both ELMA ice and this groundwater model implemented in ELMA, it's very easy to exchange that information because it's basically one program you start and you can uh, use a multi-physics coupling, uh, which actually my colleague Peter Rabak will talk about next week. So if you're interested, uh, plug in there. Uh, you can use that uh, in, in a very elegant way. So um, things are very complicated. Everything is connected to everything. So if we have, for instance, here the uh, equations of the groundwater transport, you can identify an advection, a diffusion type uh, of term, and you can also identify the contributions from other uh, from the other components. Like for instance, here uh, stuff. This is dependent on the temperature, which is the solution of the heat transfer. Uh, solute transport, YC is the, uh, is, the, is the concentration of the salts. And also the def uh, bedrock deformation has a quite strong influence on uh, directing the flow into a certain direction. And this uh, high level of mutual dependencies is also reflected then in the uh, material uh, laws here, for instance, the water groundwater density is also a function of pressure, of temperature, 
of uh, salinity, you name it. Um, to show you uh, in a very simple layout what the model can do, this is a test case uh, of the Mackenzie. Uh, it's a frozen wall at constant minus five degrees. So you expect water to build ice around it uh, and a porous mat material around this and a pressure difference applied uh, from this to this side. So the flow will go from the left to the right and will freeze around that wall. And how this looks, we can have a look now. So you see nicely here the, uh, the this white line, which indicates uh, the frozen part. So in the middle, you have the frozen part uh, and the flow, of course, then will be directed around this frozen part. So you can also have technical applications, not necessarily uh, only geophysical applications um, uh, with this model. If you're interested in that case, actually one test case of the permafrost uh, um, uh, model or permafrost branch uh, can be found in the source code. So you can uh, basically change things there and exactly recalculate what is uh, showing here on this screen. Another example, for instance, is the salinity transport. So here we have a also a very well-known benchmark problem, uh, the so-called elder problem, which imposes a constant uh, high density of salts up here, a porous medium below, uh, and uh, filled, of course, with the aquifer. And gravity then uh, takes its role and uh, produces this fingering of the uh, salt plumes uh, following gravity downwards. So these benchmarks have been used to, to, to check the consistency and the validity of the code, but uh, we also start to apply it. So one uh, example is the Rhine Glacier. That is uh, a project that has been driven by NAGRA, the Swiss uh, institution that organizes uh, uh, nuclear waste uh, repository uh, safe, safety assessments in Switzerland. So we're talking of the Rhine Glacier here, um, starting out with a flow line model. Uh, here you see basically the highest peaks of the Alps and uh, the, uh, the plains where, where the Rhine flows into. And it's a very complex uh, geology. Um, so you see a lot of, a lot of different uh, uh, rock formations here and one actually you should follow in more details is a very high conductive one. This is this lower one just above the red area. And uh, if we now take uh, exactly this uh, model and uh, apply an ice load on top of it, you will nicely see that uh, the, uh, in case here, the temperature is being advected from the highest part of the Alps really down to the plains. So let's have that animated. I hope it works. Yes, you nicely see here uh, the flow going out here. So you can just by putting an ice sheet here really have connections over several hundred kilometers uh, by uh, hydrology. Um, so simply by the high complexity of the geology here. This is the work uh, uh, still in progress uh, with uh, together with Denny Cohen. And in the end, this is the three dimensional version of the Western Alps. Uh, the plan is to really go for a three dimensional problem coupled uh, to the groundwater problem. In this case, it is not. So this is just the ice sheet model. But uh, in the end, uh, the goal is to couple that. And uh, well, um, I think we hear more next week about uh, weak and strong coupling. Uh, in Elma, but uh, let me shortly explain. So if you have the ice sheet here in the upper part and uh, the permafrost in the lower part, uh, what you usually do is either a Dirichlet Neumann or a Robin Neumann uh, coupling between these two. Here in the case, for instance, uh, for the uh, thermal problem, but the same applies also usually uh, for the mechanical problem. So what we do is um, actually we chose the other options, so we have a heat transfer coefficient 
imposed between these two layers uh, that uh, basically describes the transfer from the upper to the lower one. And we use the residual of the solution of the lower part uh, as the load for the temperature problem of the upper part. Okay, and how this looks like, uh, and, and uh, yeah, in addition to that, of course, in glaciology, since we have a ice mass sliding over the whole thing, over the bedrock, we also have surface production terms in uh, terms of frictional heating, which we can also use since we have uh, Elmer living on both sides. We can use the residual of the Stokes problem multiplied by the uh, slip velocity to uh, determine the per node uh, deposed energy um, per time unit uh, as an input uh, on the surface in between that is an additional heat source. And how this looks is here, is shown here. So I, I set up a, a, a very cold problem. You see permafrost waiting in front of the ice front here. The white line is the basically the boundary of the permafrost here and a warmer one where the permafrost doesn't really penetrate a lot. And uh, since it is a temperature dependent sliding law, maybe I hope you can spot it, the sliding actually in front of the colder uh, ice sheet uh, is reduced and the ice sheet is piling up and uh, advancing in a, in a slower way than in the warm one. So mentioning that, it means that uh, if we really want with a high accuracy have temporal evolution of ice sheets where the temperature is a determining factor of the sliding, we really need a model uh, underneath the glacier uh, to model the heat transfer and impose the uh, thermal boundary conditions uh, according to that in order to really resolve that problem in a physical way. Because there is a vast difference of the heat transfer depending on whether you have a, uh, a permafrost uh, layer waiting in front of the glacier or if the glacier basically uh, slides into already warm conditions. And um, now back to the nuclear waste repository assessment. This is now without glacier, but in a very high re resolution um, problem. Uh, here in Finland, we have a, a, a nuclear waste repository in Olkiluoto. And uh, we were cooperating together uh, with POSIVA in order to evaluate uh, the future to be expected uh, permafrost uh, penetration depth at this uh, repository site, which is about here in the model. The repository looks like that, that uh, there is a tunnel system dig down to about 400 meter uh, below sea level, where the high, uh, high grade uh, nuclear waste is uh, deposited. And our model basically includes uh, a, uh, a, 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 a rectangular section that goes down to, what is it, uh, about 2000 meters down. Uh, uh, in order to uh, assess the thermal uh, and also the groundwater uh, conditions uh, in the case of a uh, climate scenario that includes um, freezing conditions uh, at the surface. And that's how the scenario looks. So uh, from present day, uh, we of course have a strong incline by uh, man-made climate change, but then uh, we go into a cold period cold phase one here and yet another cold phase two. So this is our surface climate uh, uh, driver basically. So the temperature are prescribed at the surface. And uh, we also by the repository have a heat generation. So of course the nuclear waste uh, produces heat, which then uh, has of course a very close peak, but over the thousands of years then uh, phases out due to the radio active decay. And uh, putting that together, uh, we can drive the system forward. This is quite uh, intensive computation that has been done on our supercomputers. And uh, looking at the position of uh, the repository, we see that in no cold case scenario, so there are two of them, 
uh, the permafrost in our case reaches more than 200 meters, whereas the repository is at uh, 400 meters. Uh, so uh, it's uh, very unlikely, at least with this scenario we were running, it was just one scenario, of course, uh, to have uh, permafrost reaching uh, those depths. And here is a picture of the uh, flow patterns that are uh, to be found inside uh, the area. So the groundwater flow, uh, including an isocontour of the salinity. Of course, salinity also plays a role. And as I said, plays a role also in altering the freezing conditions uh, of the water. Uh, the whole thing can be found um, if you're interested uh, as a report to POSIVA. If you go, <coughs> excuse me, to the POSIVA.fi webpage and look for reports, uh, you can uh, dig that out. There is a lot of more information to be found. And uh, finally, this is uh, uh, a not uh, to all its end developed model, but I want to mention it since it, uh, this talk is about uh, geo, uh, physical models beyond Elmer Ice. Uh, we have an implementation of the Richards equation uh, using van genuchten uh, 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 relations. Uh, inside Elmer, there is a test case actually, um, actually two test cases, if I'm not wrong. Uh, in in in, uh, in in our source code, and you can also check uh, uh, check it out uh, as model sixty nine in the Elmer models manual, which can be found uh, on on this web page. It is also linked from the general Elmer web page. If this is a too complicated URL, and I think this brings me to the end of my talk, which already is quite long. Thanks for listening so long. Um, let me mention that next week, uh, Peter Robak is uh, presenting uh, details on multiphysics simulations in ELMA, examples exactly about weak, which we had today, and also strong coupling. So if you have a general uh, problem or uh, interest in, in coupled simulations, I think uh, this is a good place to go and uh, listen in. Else, I think we hopefully have still time for a few questions. Uh, thereby, I would like to thank for your attention and, uh, yeah, uh, give the stage free to ask a few questions if you want to. So, um, have there been any questions in the chat or on the Q and A? Thanks uh, to the small audience listening to this. Uh, I hope we get the more clicks on online then and uh, thanks for your time and uh, being here.